World War II remains the most widespread war in history, with more than 100 million military personnel mobilised. In the United Kingdom, the RAF was fundamental to the war effort in fighting to keep German Luftwaffe out of the skies over Britain. The Spitfire and Hurricanes that won the Battle of Britain in the late summer of 1940 are aircraft known around the world. In fact, many aircraft remain legendary from World War II. But there is one bomber that is a household name still today, the Lancaster. The Lancaster bomber played a key role in the Allies' victory of Nazi Germany. Its famous missions are now part of British aviation history and folklore. The successful bombing runs that the Lancaster carried out could only have been carried out with the help of pilots like Peter George. Peter was not an RAF pilot, but a pilot who helped make it all possible. As Peter George looks at the Lancaster bomber he once flew nearly 60 years ago, he reminisces about the times he had flying this incredible machine. With only one Lancaster bomber still left flying in the world today, only a few remain who can fully appreciate the power and force of the Lank as it is fondly known. Having experienced an accident during his training days in the RAF, Peter George was seen as unfit for frontline battle, but he was a fully qualified pilot. With a shortage of pilots in the RAF, his skills did not go to waste and he was able to do his bit in the war effort as a member of a civilian organisation that few remember and yet one that made it all happen, the Air Transport Auxiliary. Yes, in the early years, early part of World War II, it was recognised that there was a growing demand for moving aircraft from factories to maintenance units and storage units uh, all part of the enormous uh, rearmament schemes that had begun in the late part of the 30s. And that uh, this was going to call for a different mm. kind of uh, flying requirement than uh, was normally carried out by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy pilots. ATA was set up right at the beginning of the war. As war was breaking out, it, the first pieces of the jigsaw for ATA were being put into place. And the intention was that amateur civilian pilots who were not fit for RAF service because of health or age should be able to do something to use their skills to help the war effort. Uh, the task of creating ATA, once it had been set up in principle, fell to Gérard Delanger. He oversaw the, the transformation a bit of, of a, a bit of British improvisation which very rapidly became a large and well-oiled and incredibly efficient machine. And the credit for that goes down to him. Our boss there, uh, the, our Commodore he was called, was a man named Gerard Delange. Uh, he was a, a, an approachable, gorgeous man. Everybody got on well with him. And if I wanted to speak to him, he, he was, there was no going through anybody. I just spoke to him. He was, he was just like that. 30 pilots were selected to front the beginnings of the Air Transport Auxiliary and were responsible for carrying out a selection of ferry jobs for the RAF. The role of the ferry pilots was to move aircraft, basically the new aircraft coming out of the factories, to the squadrons to replace aircraft which had either been lost in action or had, had some problem uh, with, with them, and they would replace those aircraft as quickly as they were needed. There was a significant difference between pilots who flew for the Royal Air Force or the Fleet Air Arm and pilots who flew for ATA. Service pilots had to be absolute masters of their aircraft, especially the fighter pilots who were going into dogfights and all the rest of it. They had to explore and know their aircraft's performance to the absolute limits, what it would do, uh, what they could make it do, what they couldn't make it do, and so on and so forth. Whereas an ATA pilot, what he had to do was get his aeroplane from A to B safely and in one piece. No heroics, um, aerobatics were banned, no high-speed flight. There was a set 
cruising speed for ATA delivery flights for each type of aircraft. ATA pilots had to be jacks of all trade because they were flying so many different types, whereas RAF pilots had to be absolute experts in one particular type. That's a big difference. In the early stages of the Air Transport Auxiliary, the initials ATA was said to stand for Ancient and Tattered Airmen. The first pilots who were recruited by ATA and signed their contracts within eight days of the outbreak of war were all fairly mature gentlemen, uh, and Delanger jested that ATA stood for Ancient and Tattered Airmen. Well, they were. Uh, some of them had even fought in the First World War in the Royal Flying Corps. The most prominent of these was a man called uh, Stuart Keith Jopp, who had only one eye and only one arm. And there's a correspondence between ATA management and the Royal Air Force about ATA pilots with only one arm and whether or not they should be allowed to deliver aircraft. Well, ATA said, well, they have been. And they haven't had any accidents yet, so we think they should go on doing it. The Honourable Charles Dutton only had one arm. His arm, he had his arm off up here. And he flew it with one, and he used to take off and hold the control stick between his legs like that while he was working the throttle. Whilst these disabilities prevented qualified pilots from being in the RAF, the ATA allowed them to carry out the job they had trained so hard to do. It was immediately apparent that the work the ATA did was invaluable to the war effort. The organisation rapidly expanded to take over all ferry jobs from the RAF with a growing number of pilots. Flying training really began with my father. I was an Air Force officer and he taught me to fly at East Church. I then applied early in the war for Air Force Air Crew, but I had a triple problem with my eyesight. I did think for one time I would never be able to fly, I would be, have to go join one of the other armed services. But then I wrote to ATA and asked, was asked to report to Hatfield. My father-in-law said, have you heard of the Air Trans Auxiliary? I said, no. I said, what they do? So he said, they ferry aircraft of all sorts and their headquarters at White Walthams. So I gave them a ring immediately and they said, come on down. And I started off with them and stayed with them to the end of the war, which was about four and a half years, I suppose. The Air Transport Auxiliary was a proficient civilian organisation that not only employed a large number of pilots, they employed personnel to carry out a number of other duties. Um, ATA employed over 3,500 people in the course of the war, and not all of those were pilots. About 1,200 of them were pilots or flight engineers, so there are our air crew to fly the aeroplanes. They also employed a number of teenagers, uh, air training corps cadets, as supplementary crew, and these youngsters had a wonderful time uh, because they got to fly with or famous people, and they also got to fly in amazing aeroplanes. And their task was uh, things like emergency undercarriage lowering in case of a hydraulic failure or something like that, where the pilot, him or herself, could fly the aeroplane and do the emergency uh, actions at the same time. So the youngsters flew as, uh, as supplementary pilots, and say so they had a terrific time. I got into the ATA in... Uh... 1941, because I was sent there by the uh, Ministry of Labour, it's called Direction of Labour, and um, I went there for the interview, three of us went, I stayed, the other two didn't, didn't get the job or didn't try, didn't like the job, and that's how it all started. I was very young when I joined ATA, I, I joined as a, as a cadet, and so I always flew with someone else, I never flew on my own. Uh, so consequently, I, I, the responsibility it was a captain of the aircraft that day. I was a cadet, but I was a messenger, you know, you were a gopher. It involved um, working where you were told to, to start with, and, uh, and in offices, and, uh, and sometimes going onto the airfield to make sure that, uh, that the person who, 
who was sent to be a fire watch or home guard that night did it, you'd have to ask and listen to their lies. Well, you could imagine how that was. You were 14 and they were 40. You know, I didn't stand much chance of that, but uh, just a, a dog's body. We mustn't forget all the people who worked for ATA on the ground. Uh, for a start, there were ground engineers in the hangars at every ATA base uh, maintaining the air taxi aeroplanes and so on. Uh, there were ground instructors and flight instructors too because ATA ran its own uh, flying training schools. They employed nurses who came on medical flights with them and uh, ran the medical center at each base. Uh, and then there were people in the canteen keeping the records about the pilots, keeping the financial records going and so on. And every one of them in their way contributed to the overall achievements of ATA. As the demand for ATA pilots continued to increase, the Secretary of State for Air proposed that the ATA open its ranks to women. The distinction between civilian and military resources were erased as men and women worked together to do their bit in the war effort. Before the war, Delanger would have known Pauline Gower, who became the head of the women's section of, of ATA. By the time the war arrived, Pauline Gower had the phenomenal amount of flying experience. She'd flown thousands and thousands of passengers uh, safely, had several thousand hours, and phenomenal experience in terms of aviation. And when she was asked before the war, which people could see coming, is there any reason why women shouldn't fly in the war that is about to happen? Her answer was simple, why not? She was stationed at HQ, which was at White Waltham, so one didn't see her too often, but she was a splendid person, terribly sweet and kind. She did everything. She, she managed to get women into the air transport auxiliary and she uh, just pursued this. And so we were flying everything. We were flying all these military airplanes, which was absolutely wonderful. The first women joined on the 1st of January 1940. But equality hadn't arrived, not entirely, because they were restricted to flying trainer aircraft and non-operational aircraft. So they all turned up at the de Havilland factory at Hatfield in Hertfordshire where the, the, the factory was turning out open cockpit biplanes by the million for, um, for training uh, establishments. And the ladies in the depths of winter were charged with ferrying these aircraft uh, to flying training schools all over the country. The ATA initially employed eight ladies to become ferry pilots they immediately proved themselves capable of carrying out these duties, and so more ladies were invited into the organisation. Well, ever since I'd been up with my brother at an air display, I thought I'd like to learn to fly. And there never seemed to be an opportunity until eventually Air Transport Auxiliary said they needed people to come and become pilots. And so I put my name forward and eventually I came for a flight test and um, they decided I might be suitable, so I joined. I think I must have been about 18, 17 or 18 at the time. And then the opportunity came when I joined the forces, I joined the WAF. And I stayed there until, oh, an advert, I saw an advert, ad advertising, and it said, wanted volunteers required to train as pilots for air transport auxiliary. I didn't think for a minute that I would have been accepted because I thought thousands of people would have applied. And uh, so, it is, but I was accepted and uh, that was the start of my long life. Thank you very much. <laughs> the first woman to fly a hurricane was Winnie Crossley, one of the first eight who joined uh, in 1940. But this wasn't until the 19th of July, 1941. She and I think three of her colleagues were flight tested on a hurricane on that day, they passed. And so this was the beginning of equality of opportunity for ATA's women pilots to, to fly almost all the operational types. They moved eventually from the single-engined operational aircraft up to the twin-engine bombers, such as the Wellington and the Blenheim and so on. And a very small number of them eventually uh, flew four-engine bombers 
I had the Halifax and the Lancaster as well, but they were a very, very special sisterhood. There were only 11 of them. I was flying to Wellington one day, and um, I landed at the airfield, I taxied in, and then uh, the uh, ground crew came out to pick me up. There was this great big Wellington beside me, and I said, can, can we go, because I have to get my chit signed. And they said, uh, no, we're waiting for the pilot. And I said, oh, well, I am the pilot. And to my amazement, they didn't believe me, and they went and searched the aeroplane. <laughs> they found no one. Uh, within ATA, the men and the women were effectively treated equally. Uh, they were just pilots. They were all getting on with this job. Now, there were some exceptions to that. At Whitchurch near Bristol, the commanding officer refused to have any women on his ferry pool. But in contrast to that, there were two ferry pools at Cosford near uh, Wolverhampton and at Hamble, which were all women, with women commanding officers and w women adjutants and women uh, operations officers and everything else. But at most places, they were mixed up. They were nearly all, or the women were nearly always a minority. But men and women flew together, they socialised together, and so on. Well, as far as I'm aware, they used to treat males and females exactly the same. No problem at all. I didn't see any difficulties at all. I'm often asked, was there any um, prejudice against women? You know, uh, and if there was, I didn't notice. I, I often say that if someone pinched my behind. I was thankful I was attractive enough to get my behind pinched. I wasn't going to run off and report them for, for sexual discrimination. There were the odd. I remember the first time um, we had a, a gaggle of, we still weren't fully trained, we had a lot of tiger moths come onto the, uh, but we had to fly to St Athen. And the boy said, see you when we get there, Joy, if you get there. You got odd remarks like that. But we were paid the same, we wore the same, wore the same uniform, and we were all in it together. And as far as I was concerned, there was no discrimination at all. Overall, ATA employed around about 1,200 pilots and flight engineers. Over 1,000 of them were men, and 168 were women, of whom four were flight engineers. So female flight engineers were quite a rare breed. With a strong force of 1,200 pilots in the midst of war, the ATA had to train each individual to be able to fly a wide range of different aircraft. Training was carried out in a number of different class stages and was normally generic according to the size of the aircraft. Training that was most interesting because it was concentrated into a very short period of about three months and normally it would take a year. When a pilot joined ATA, uh, they were checked out to see which aircraft they could fly, whether it was twin-engine, four-engine or whatever. When I first trained, we were on s slow singles, is what they called them, but they were things like the Magister and the Tiger Moss. And uh, I flew until you could get solo, you see, and then you soloed on those little aircraft. And then you went on to the fast one, which was the Harvard. But that was another kettle of fish completely. Well, it, it was in about five to six stages. Uh, you, you started out, most pilots were given an extensive cross-country flying course because we were going to fly without radio, without any radio aids. There was what was called class two conversion, which uh, gave you training in high-powered single-engined aircraft and introduced you to flying all the fighters, uh, single-engine fighters. In Class 3 was light twins. There were only really two or three of them, Oxford and Anson. But the Anson was very important to us. It was our principal taxi aircraft, conveyed pilots to and from factories. In Class 4 was the British heavy twin including, for example, the British heavy bombers of the early part of the war. Then there was a very short introductory course into American twins. We called it 4 Plus. That was done on the Lockheed Hudson. And then Class 5 was conversion to four-engine aircraft. And very few of us then even got as far as flying boats, Class 6.
and that was the full extent of our training progression. Now, obviously, you couldn't train an ATA pilot on a hundred different sorts of aeroplanes. You'd be forever training them. So in each class, they trained on a typical type for that class. And if we take the single-engine operational aircraft, they trained largely on the Harvard uh, North American aeroplane. It was fairly high speed, high performance, and having trained on a Harvard, they were then allowed to fly the Hurricane, the Spitfire, the Mustang, the Tempest, and so on. The other thing, of course, is that, for instance, there were no two-seater Spitfires during the Second World War. So you couldn't take somebody up for an hour to demonstrate how to do it. The first time they flew a Spitfire, they were on their own. You set off in the morning, and sometimes in the taxi aircraft going over, you'd be looking at a book in your hands which would tell you about the aircraft you were about to fly that day. You may not have seen one before, let alone flown one, so you'd look at that particular page on that particular aircraft, see how you got into it, how you started it, how you took it off and flew it, how you landed it. So by the time you arrived at the destination point, you would be ready to get into the aircraft with your notes, say, on your lap, here in front of you. Well, it was very exciting stepping into a plane you hadn't flown before, but really you just needed to know the takeoff speed, landing speed, stalling speed, and I guess it's equivalent to step into a car you haven't driven before. It's not, not all that different. And it was only um, you in the plane <laughs> who didn't feel you had anyone else to be responsible for. So, yes, I suppose a little nerve-wracking at first, but we were young. You know, nothing, nothing phased us. Rather like youngsters today, bungee jump or do all sorts of things. The role of the ferry pilot was a demanding one, as your training progressed through the different classes, as did your rank. After starting as a cadet, you became a third officer, then up to second officer and first officer. ATA may have been a civilian organisation, but it had a splendid hierarchy of ranks. Flying with it in the ATA was, was exceedingly joyful and it was, it was uh, always pleasurable and uh, no responsibilities and only for winding the wheels up and pumping the flaps and, and the rest of the time was pure enjoyment. And uh, if it was an old pilot, he'd, he'd let me have a little stir as well. He'd uh, fly it from the, from the number two seat. Uh, to, um, but coming home, Always, it was thrown in the back, right, because um, there was a pecking order and uh, I was a long way down, so I didn't get to sit up front coming home. There were about 16 different ferry pools dotted around the country at different airfields. Uh, some were larger than others. Uh, some flew only one type of aircraft or two or three types of aircraft. But basically, we all came under the control of the central ferry control at Andover in Hampshire. ATA's pilots were distributed around the country in what they called ferry pools, and these were located, generally speaking, near to the major aircraft factories. The furthest one south was at Hamble, near Southampton, and the furthest north was at Lossiemouth, which is near Inverness. I was sent up to Cosford, which is in the middle of the country, near Warsaw, I think, Birmingham, somewhere up there. Uh, for the most part, I was stationed at number 15 ferry pool, which was at Hamble, and my rank was First Officer Mary Wilkins. But I was stationed, first of all, at Tame, that's where I did my training. Then I went up to Cosford, and then I went to Ratcliffe. When you got to the airfield in the morning, uh, if you were at your home base particularly, you go to your pigeonhole, and in there you'd find the delivery chits for the day's work. And then, of course, you'd come up here notes with your buddies. And they say, say, What have you got, George? I say, Well, I've got a barracuda. So I say, Well, leave us your watch, will you? <laughs> what made the ATA unique was the fact that they flew more types of aircraft during their time with the ATA than any pilot would anywhere in the world, even today. The aircraft that ATA flew were of British manufacturer, American manufacturer, Canadian manufacturer. By the end of the war, if you looked up and saw a warplane flying over your head, it had been flown by an ATA pilot. 
So ATA, as well as Ancient and Tattered Airmen, also stood for anything to anywhere. Um, I was keener on flying manoeuvrable high-performance aircraft. I preferred that. Uh, so Spitfires, yes. The Typhoon was an interesting aeroplane. It had an incredible engine with 24 cylinders, uh, 2,200 horsepower, uh, made an incredible sound. It was interesting, perhaps, rather than my favorite, but um, an aeroplane I'm very glad to have flown. The luck of the draw that this length, which was built in Canada in about uh, in the 1940s, should now finish up at, at Duxford. And uh, the only reason it would be special, I suppose, is the fact that I actually flew it. But uh, from Wimeswold near Nottingham to Aston Down near Bath. But I mean, other than that, there was nothing spectacular, nothing broke. And <laughs> My flight engineer is still alive. <laughs> ATA pilots flew all these different types of aeroplanes to scores of different airfields, some of which were big ones like bomber bases and so on, and some of which were tiny little grass fields. If you look at an aviation map of the Second World War, well, East Anglia, where it's flat and is nearest to Germany, you could walk from one end of East Anglia to another, from one airfield to another. So there are records in pilots' logbooks where they've actually kept a count of the number of airfields that they visited, and one of them had 160 different airfields in his logbook. Some were only used in temporary nature, and some were permanent. I mean, White Waltham, for instance, from day one, right until we, we finished, it was very, it was operational, and some of them were, but some airfields were just used uh, for a matter of months. I think I went to 210 different uh, airfields, landing strips and whatnot. Some of the remoter airfields were, I would say, Lossiemouth, which, as you know, is in Scotland, and it was quite a dreadful place. The wind howled, and it's still operational, of course. That, I think, was probably the worst. During their working lives as ferry pilots, these men and women certainly had some memorable flights. I landed my first bit far with the wheels up. <laughs> you ought not to tell them that. <laughs> They didn't like me very much for that, I can tell you. <laughs> I had many memorable flights, but on one occasion, it was hardly a flight, but we climbed into a walrus, which, as you know, is an amphibious aircraft. And I was nicely settled in, we started the engine, and it caught fire. So we hastened to get out again, so that I don't really think that counts as a flight, but it was quite memorable. I was flying over the New Forest, and suddenly there was no noise, and the engine had stopped, and I knew I couldn't stay up there. So I had to look around to see quickly where I could land, and I saw a little field, and then I did all the manoeuvres necessary to land the aircraft in this little field, which I did, that was all right, and then I had to be rescued myself because the cows and the horses came round as, as they wanted to know what on earth was going on. <laughs> Some of the most amusing things that happened to me was I was flying over Kukubrishar, I can never pronounce that right, Kukubrishar, and I smelled the sink, smell, and I thought, oh, that must be the lavender coming from the hills. So I opened the canopy, and right enough, the smell did get a bit stronger, until I looked down, and the hydraulic fluid had burst all over my feet. And what I was smelling was the hydraulic fluid all around my feet. No, I had no accidents, except at one minor incident when I had a tyre burst on takeoff, and uh, the undercarriage was pulled off and the aircraft pretty well wrecked. <laughs>
until eventually it came to a stop and I was able to get out with everybody else because we were fully loaded with about 12 people on board the Anson. And uh, we all crept out and we all seemed all right. The next day we realised we were covered in bruises, but otherwise we were perfectly all right and went on flying. Uh, all the time that I was, that I was in, in the ATA and was flying, even a, a official ATA or unofficial ATA, I never had a, a, an anxious moment. And everything always went perfectly, including landing back at base with, um, with virtually no visibility at all. Now, everything went sweet with me during the war. Pilots were faced with a number of testing conditions to fly these aircraft in. Bad weather, enemy fire, and even friendly fire. I was flying in some bad weather one day and I think I strayed a little off course and suddenly I saw puffs of smoke around me and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm being shot at. And uh, I, I thought, uh, I'd better turn around and get out of here. So I did a 180 and off I went and I didn't hear any more about it. But I think it was the ground crew, they mistook uh, the aeroplane because I was going the wrong way. No disparaban los mismos ingleses, tanto la artillería antiaérea como, como los barcos. Porque había zonas que estaban eran totalmente prohibidas sobrevolarlas y uno en mal tiempo la sobrevolaba. Entonces, no disparaban. Oh, well, I picked up a, a machine called a uh, Whitley. I mean, it was a joke, really. Uh, it flew on a couple of Merlins, although they did have some that were, had a Tiger radial engine. And I picked up this thing from uh, Coventry, where they made them. And there was myself and my flight engineer, and we were taking the thing down to St Athens in South Wales. It was a gorgeous day, not a cloud in the sky. And we were sitting at about a couple of thousand feet, probably having a fag or something, minding our own business. And the route took, took us down the Bristol Channel uh, to St Athens. And I could see in the distance this crowd of ships and boats and whatnot congregating off, I think it was Swansea. And it was obviously a convoy that was I'd either come across the Atlantic or was going across the Atlantic. And I could understand them having uh, been trigger happy with a gun. And we were always advised, don't fly over a congregating ships, because if you do, they'll have you for breakfast. You see, and I said to my flight engineer, I said, as we're going at the moment, we'll go right over the top of these people. So I said, they don't like that. And so, um, I was just about to turn off in good time and all of a sudden there was a bloody great bang and a cloud of smoke and which went past the wingtip. And uh, I said to my flight engineer, hey, bugger, they're shooting at us. I said, that ain't friendly. <laughs> Towards the end of the war, the, at the time of the last Christmas, 1944, a group of pilots at the ferry pool at Ratcliffe uh, discovered that if they flew to Northern Ireland and went across the boundary into the Irish Republic, they could find a supply of unrationed turkeys. So they took an aeroplane off to Northern Ireland, they went across the border into the Irish Republic, they were civilians, remember, not servicemen, bought up goodness knows how many turkeys, piled them in the back, in the back of their aeroplane, and then delivered them all around the country to all the other ferry pools so that they could all have a decent turkey for Christmas dinner. I think that's absolutely wonderful. I took one Spitfire round to an indicated 500 miles per hour, which was probably the maddest thing I ever did, because the controls became like they were welded to the floor. Uh, everything went quiet. There was a strong smell of petrol. And, um, I was just wondering how I was going to get out of the dive because um, it felt as though if I pulled back on the stick, it would just fly to fly apart. <laughs> 
But anyway, I trimmed it out. I used the trimmer to bring it out. And uh, anyway, I went across Litchfield Airfield where I was delivering it. And two of my chums were in dispersal. When I taxied in, you know, they said, what the hell were you doing, George? <laughs> so I, was, I was just motoring along. <laughs> but I found out that the never exceed speed for that mark of Spitfire was 480 miles an hour. And I got it round to them and indicated 500. But little did I realise how dangerous it was because I always had the feeling they wouldn't fly apart, but they would do. <laughs> Although ATA pilots had a heck of a lot of fun, they also suffered as well. It was a dangerous job with filthy weather, mechanical failure and so on. And in total, 173 ATA pilots and flight engineers lost their lives in ATA service. That's quite a high percentage. The biggest collection of ATA graves is actually in Maidenhead, not far from White Waltham, the ATA's headquarters. And there are 17 ATA graves in Maidenhead. They represent both sexes, men and women, and five different nationalities. So that group of graves, in fact, tells the ATA story all on its own. 173 were killed flying with ATA. Uh, sometimes this is due to weather conditions, sometimes it would be because it was an aircraft they'd never flown before. There were always these difficulties of picking up an aircraft you'd never seen before, let alone flown. Oh, I knew one very boy very well who was killed. He, he ended up, I think he was in bad weather, and he flew into a hill and killed himself. The man who gave me my first flight in aircraft, he got killed about two weeks or three weeks afterwards. And so that was a little bit sad because he was always good for, you know, like, you want to fly today, boy, that sort of thing. And it was, uh, it was a, a regular. One of my best friends was, uh, was uh, killed, unfortunately. The CO would come and tell us uh, there has been an accident. Unfortunately, it was a fatal accident. And uh, so I hope you will understand and uh, have tomorrow off. Don't come in to fly. After that, all will be well. I wouldn't think we had that number of air, air misses in total. Uh, the only one I can remember from our ferry pool was um, the length um, piloted by Tommy Thompson and he collided with a Blenheim over Harlaxton, Grantham and unfortunately he went in and was killed with his flight engineer. I lost a very dear friend, a man who was a training with us and he, he ran, flew into a shag heap on the Motherwell, the, 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 the coal mines all have these shag heaps, and they, he flew into that. Una sola amiga, sí, perdí bastante compañera, pero no amiga. Pero la única que verdaderamente era mi amiga era Bridget Hill, que él se mató como pasajera de un Fairchild, de un taxi Fairchild. Well, you couldn't stop and mourn them in the middle of the war. You were much too busy getting on with things. It was after the war that I felt sad thought of all the people I should have been celebrating with who weren't there anymore. Like Rachel, weeping for her children because they are not. Couldn't forget it. You kept thinking of us all the time when you're flying. And then when you did come down to earth, you sort of think of, think of him all the time. That was a very sad time. But I was lucky, really, to survive it all. Well, so many of my friends didn't. Mm. In the early months of 1945, I think everybody knew that we were going to win the war. And plans were beginning to be made to wind down ATA. The first thing, in fact, before that, there were plans being made to wind down aircraft production. So it became clear that there were going to be fewer and fewer aeroplanes to ferry around uh, in the remaining months of the war, however long it took. Uh, and the task for which ATA had been set up was going to disappear 
because the RAF suddenly would have a surplus of pilots again once combat finished. And so gradually, over the summer of 1945, the ferry pools began to close, uh, one after the other, until in the autumn, the only two left were at Whitchurch and at White Waltham, the headquarters airfield. When the war ended in 1945, it was decided to set up the ATA as an association so we could all keep together as we've been together during the war. And that's what we've done ever since 1945. We've kept going and going and going. And a lots of sons and daughters have joined us, and that's kept our numbers right up, which is great. Once the ATA was closed down, the men and women who had dedicated their time to helping the RAF stay equipped with military aircraft were forgotten. Many went on to work in the aviation industry. Many did not. The Air Transport Auxiliary were first recognised for the work they did during the war in 2008. We were invited by, by the Prime Minister to 10 Downing Street where um, we were entertained and given a medal for our achievements during the war. Unfortunately, it came rather late because so many people had passed away and they were the people that really should have had a, the medals. But the few of us that were left uh, accepted these with gratitude. The Prime Minister shook her hands and said, well done, he said, you know, it was a wonderful job you did. And I said to him, I didn't feel it was like work. You know, you did when you were doing it, you didn't feel as if you were working, but that's what you were doing. It was such a wonderful job, you know, having two or three different planes in the same day, and all so different. Yes, it was all, I must say, it was very exciting. And we were very lucky to have a job like that, I think. It had its moments, everything does, doesn't it? And the English weather and that sort of thing. But um, we were really very lucky. I enjoyed every minute of it, to tell you the truth. And uh, I go through it all again, if I had to. My fondest memories of, of, uh, of it were, were getting to fly. It, it, was, it was really my own own interest in the, in the job. The job wasn't interesting, but the flying was interesting. And we're again like 14 years old, or what, what I care about achievements. I, I think they, they made an excellent contribution to the war because had the ATA not been formed, who would fly these aircraft? New aircraft from factories or older aircraft which were um, to be repaired. I would say I'm full of admiration for the work that ATA did during the war. ATA's contribution to victory was immense. Without them, the frontline pilots would have had no aeroplanes to fly. And the figures are staggering. In the six years of the war, they delivered over 309,000 aeroplanes. If you do the maths, that works out at 141 aircraft ferried by ATA pilots every single day for six years, which is amazing. And yet, they've been forgotten. And they shouldn't be forgotten. It's a wonderful story. It's one of those stories in history that if it wasn't true, you wouldn't believe it. The multi-million dollar haul of Japan's last shoguns in our sights later catch up with Raiders of the Lost Past, new and exclusive to yesterday at 5. Blowing open a Dutch disaster next in Secret War. Dave's taking you back to school. You will need...